up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Unlimited Resources. I'm one of your resources, uh, Luis Scott Vargas, joined on the line by Ben Stark, Magic the Gathering Hall of Famer and Limited Mastermind. Uh, we've got a special episode this week, and I, I kind of thought about Ben pretending that this was just the new podcast, but a lot of people would be very angry at me if I did that. So d- despite the Unlimited Resources joke, uh, Limited Resources is alive and well. Marshall just had some passport issues and got to Barcelona late enough that we decided to uh, take over the show and run it ourselves this week. So welcome, Ben. Hey, and who could be mad at you for upgrading Marshall into me? Don't you just mean everybody would be ecstatic? <laughs> see, see, I wasn't going to make that joke, but I guess I did by calling it unlimited resources. <laughs> you, which... set, you set me up for it too hard for me not to make it. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is before I even joined LR, I did joke to Marshall that I was going to start unlimited resources with with you. So th- this is really just that coming to fruition. But before we get to our show and the, and the topics therein, I'm going to talk about our sponsors. Uh, first sponsor, of course, is ChannelFireball.com. It sponsors both Ben and I as well as this show. Channel Fireball is a great place to get you know awesome free content like this and tons of videos, articles. Plus, it's a great place to buy and sell cards. So certainly recommend ChannelFireball.com. The second sponsor of the show is, of course, you. This show is brought to you by the patrons. So patreon.com slash Lunar Resources. If you want to sign up, then it's a great way to support the show and you know, unlock a little bit of free content there too, or a little bit of extra content rather. I guess it's specifically not free uh, there. But of course, everyone gets the show. At, you know, that's one of the things that we have delivered since the beginning. So those are our sponsors. And we're going to get into our giveaway. There's a playmat uh looks like the Grand Prix Philadelphia playmat from 2012 with weaponized corn. It's uh, The winner is Fiddy AE. That, I guess, was the name on the Patreon. So we'll be sending that to you, or Marshall will, because I, I don't handle the mail. And let's get to a, cr- a crack-a-pack. I, I asked Ben if you wanted to do a Ultimate Masters crack-a-pack, but you, you said you've drafted none of the set, right? Since Dominaria has been on Arena, I've just been hammering that uh, in addition to Ravnica. Uh, Ultimate Masters looks cool, but Dominaria is one of my favorites, so I had to play it while it was up there. All right, well, we're going to do neither then. We're going to do a Guilds of Ravnica crack a pack because we're also going to talk about Guilds. But our topic today is drafting the hard way, and that's kind of your breakout article on Channel Fireball now five years ago, more than that, actually. And it's you put into words what a lot, how a lot of you know great players thought about draft and also described how most people draft, which is drafting the easy way, which is, you know, unsurprisingly not drafting the best way. So we're going to, we're going to kind of break that down for you. And then, you know, especially apply it to Guilds of Ravnica. And then we're going to do some questions. So let's get to our crack a pack here. We've got radical ideas kicking things off. It's good. I mean, I, we're, if we had to first pick it, that would be very disappointing. When you see a radical idea, what deck do you, do you lean more towards? Is it or Demir? I guess is it based on the keyword, but I think it's quite good in Demir and is it? Demir just Demir's cards aren't that expensive, so like Flood Out is one of the big problems for that deck. And it's also pretty nice with Surveil too. Yeah, and also that's a late game deck every time, Demir. So I mean honestly I think it's just a good blue card in either Is It or Demir. Next up we've got Celestia Locket, which unsurprisingly not going to be picked uh, anywhere close to first, hopefully. Agreed, but uh, it is worth a quick mention that I do think the Lockets are actually slightly underrated as a whole. It's not like they're great, but I think they're playable, and I don't see people play them very often. Do you, what kind of decks do, would you prefer to play Lockets in? Ones where ramp would be good. If you have more fives and fours, uh, the more expensive your cards are, five plus, uh, the more you want the effect of spending turn three to put an extra land into play. But the thing is, since they turn into two cards like in the late game, that's going to be over a spell. So as long as the ramp is valuable like for you, then like they turn back into spells later. So I actually think they're pretty effective and people don't use them nearly enough. I'm not disagreeing. Like I would never first pick one. Sometimes uh, they don't make my main, depends on your deck. But a lot of times I play one locket in my decks and I, I don't think a lot of people are doing that. And I do think that it's a mistake. That's a good note. Uh, next up, we've got Muse Drake. How do you feel about this one? Well, that's another solid playable. I would take Radical Idea over it. Uh, I think they're pretty close, though. Uh, next up, we've got Wall of Mist. I mean, it's a fine playable, too, for the blue control decks. Uh, if nothing else, you're boarding it in. But if you have to first pick any of the cards you've named so far, this is not a <laughs> this is not okay. Uh, next up, we've got Torch Courier, which is certainly not going to first pick. Uh, then we've got Crawl Foragers, which... I, I found overperformed in general. Which card is this? 
This is the four and a green, four, four, and undergrowth gain a life for each creature in your graveyard. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I like it because uh, if you play against Boros, the life gain just wins you the game, basically. And uh, otherwise, it's a solid body. It's a fine card. Uh, I don't know if I would take it. I guess Radical Idea is still our chip leader at the moment. This is this is a bad pack so far. I hope the commons are going to get better, or at least there's going to be good on commons and rares. If you have to first pick any of these cards, that's a horrible first pick. Yeah, we're going to skip over Crushing Canopy and Urban Utopia. Neither of those anywhere in the zip code. Uh, Child of Night? Not first pickable. Okay playable. Uh, what about Leapfrog? That's the three one that gets flying when you have an instant or sorcery played this turn. I'm still taking Radical Idea. Uh, there's some Izzet Aggro decks where Leapfrog is definitely better, but those decks kind of want Radical Idea too because they're just like a way to not flood out and stock up and you discard them to all the jump start. So I, I wouldn't take Leapfrog over Radical Idea. Pick one. All right, here's the first card that we wouldn't be unhappy to first pick, Inescapable Blaze, the four red red deal six at instant speed. Agreed. I like that card. Uh, if you're blue-red, you can make it cost less with Electromancers and you're playing late games. If you're red-white, you're, you're very aggressive and all you have to do is get them to six. Uh, it's not an amazing card, but it's a card I would definitely take over Radical Idea and I wouldn't consider it an embarrassing first pick, but I wouldn't consider it a good first pick either. So this card's not in the pack, but I was uh, curious, how, how do you stack up Inescapable Blaze and Direct Current? Uh, I take Direct Current. I just think that it's too much more important to have cards that you can play when you're stuck on three mana. You just don't get to six every game right away and limited before you're too far behind. Uh, Direct Current is just cheap and flexible. All right. Yeah, I I have that too, but it it is interesting because Blaze is in some ways more powerful. Oh, yeah. Blaze Uh, is definitely more powerful. More powerful it generally does mean better. Uh, Next up, we've got (laughs) Beam Splitter Mage. This is the blue-red 2-2 that... Copies any spell cast on it. The hard to cast grizzly bear. Yeah, being flutter mage is, uh, despite the living the dream sometimes with maximize altitude, it's not not a card I, I am clamoring to put in my deck. A lot of is it cards here. Our last uncommon is smelt ward minotaur, the three mana two three that when you play an instant or sorcery it makes a creature unable to block. Taking deal six over that. And we've got a mythic rare, so. Pretty good chance we end up walking away with that. That's Lazav the Multifarious. This is blue-black for a 1-3, enters the battlefield, surveil 1. You can pay X to copy a creature in your graveyard with cost X, and it keeps this ability. Yeah, I mean, it's funny that it's a mythic. That's my pick. I think it's better than Blaze. I think it's a good card, a first pick. I don't think it's some incredible mythic like Demon or something like that. But it's still a pretty powerful card. The fact that it can change into anything at any time. And just getting surveil 1 on a a good 2-drop is already just good. Like, it helps you hit land three on turn two or helps you clear lands from the top of your deck when you don't need more. And you're getting, like, a very solid uh, two-mana card for two. You know, you're paying two for a very solid card. So I I just think that's, like, a good card, but not a card I would ever classify as broken or anything like that. Would you take something like a Dead Waiter or or Deadly Visit over it? Uh, I don't think so, but it feels close, not just like, oh, no, slam the Mythic. Right. And then we have a, is it Guildgate, but we are not taking the Guildgate. So yeah, we're going to take Lazav here, and the next person we assume is probably going to take Inescapable Blaze. Uh, yeah, there's not a whole lot of other options. So yeah, dec- a decent start. Not the best pack in the world, of course. This, this pack is horrible. Yeah, not the, that's not the best pack in the world. <laughs> <laughs> this pack is atrocious. Uh, all right, let's let's move on to drafting the hard way. So this this is an article you wrote, uh, and it's a philosophy that you know. Honestly, it's funny. I can actually offer a, a interesting perspective on this because when you met me and when we first started teaming together, I was really bad at draft. Like this isn't you know, and you you're, you'll be you'll be willing to back this up pretty easily. This is not false modesty. This isn't like oh yeah, I'm so bad at draft. No, I was actually really bad at draft. Oh, I know. Like, I did many team drafts with you. Yeah, I just did not know how to draft. And I my results were carried based on me playing well. Like, it wasn't because I was drafting good decks or putting, though sometimes I'd end up with a good deck, of course, or putting myself in a position to draft good decks. It was just, I was drafting the easy way. This is what everyone does. It's, you open the, your pack, you take the best card. Your next pack, you take the best card. And if those happen to be in two different colors, those are just your colors and you just draft those colors. Like, very simple. But... It's really not the best way to draft because let's say I first pick a great blue card and second pick a, a pretty good black card. And then I just start taking mediocre blue and black cards, passing good red and white cards. Because the person on my right taking blue and black cards, I'll just end up with a bad deck. Like my deck will not be as good as if I had switched colors. And it's so 
hard for people to abandon their first picks and so tempting to just, you know, well, I opened this great blue-black card, I should be blue-black, that people just tend to, to kind of tunnel vision there. And I, I know I did this. I I was extremely bad at uh, kind of adjusting here. And there's a better way to draft. So I guess, can you start to walk us through kind of like what the goals of your way to draft are and kind of how you put it into practice? Well, I think it's, uh, I think the basic theory of draft is your decision points are going to be uh, every pick, of course. You right. And... What you're doing is you have the rest of the draft to be rewarded, let's say, for uh, – not not rewarded, but that's not a good word. You have the rest of the draft uh, in order to gain value through those decision points. So when you do what you were talking about, which is take, let's say, the best card in the pack is blue, the second best pack I – in mean, the second pack, the best card is green. So you have a blue and a green card, so now you draft blue green no matter what. If you're not seeing blue and green cards, picks three, four, five, and six – then what's going to happen, as you said, is your deck's probably going to end up bad because in pack three, you're probably not going to see good blue or green cards. Whereas uh, if let's say in that example, you switch to red, white because the people pass you are blue, green. Now you have the rest of the draft to get red and white cards. So the earlier you switch, the more rewarded you're going to get. So the earlier you find the open colors, the better. Now, I'm not psychic. You're not psychic. It doesn't matter how good you are at magic. You don't know whether you're being cut off or not. You don't know what colors are being underdrafted. So that's why there's no exact formula to draft. But what you're trying to do is weight how good a card is with how likely it is to make your deck and kind of combine those over each decision point, pick one, pick two, pick three, pick four, to give yourself uh, the, the best the most value you can get out of the rest of the draft. So an, an example of what you're talking about, because it sounds like I don't want it to sound like you need to, you know, be, you know, calculating probabilities every pick. That's just not how people really draft or it's not. But look at look at first pick. A lot of times when we talk about a card, like especially when we're like reviewing gold cards and step aside from Ravnica, because Ravnica is a different animal because there's only five decks in Ravnica, whereas all, the most sets have like around seven or eight. You know, all the two color pairs are supposed to be draftable, and a couple of them end up being kind of bad. But basically, all the two color pairs are fine. Yeah. Outside of that, definitely. Yeah. Outside of that, when you open a like a blue white gold card that's like an eight out of ten, and there's a monocolor card that's a seven out of ten, because you only put the blue white card in your deck like thirty percent of the time, forty percent of the time, whereas you might play the red card like seventy percent of the time, it's still better to take the the slightly worse card there, and that's what you're talking about. Yeah, and it, it's. Somebody listening might go, well, can't you just play the blue-white card 100% of the time? You get to choose what you draft. But the thing is, if pick by pick, you could come up with a better deck taking the single color card and then uh, the best card that you see after that, because now you have more options. Uh, or if you take the blue-white card, then you just have to take the blue card and the white card if you are if you were going to just stick to it. If you wanted to play it 100% of the time, you would have less options. So you would end up with a worse deck on average by taking the 8 out of 10 if it forced you to take only blue and white cards as opposed to taking the 7 out of 10 because it's only one color. So you have a higher chance to see that color than you do to see both colors, which is what you're saying. Right. So so like it's what you're trying to do is wait – you're trying to give yourself the best chance to take the most good cards you can get out of the rest of the draft. And you so the so the, the way to solve draft is take take as many good cards as you can. Yeah, but you also have to you also have to like kind of wait it because I mean, what if the card is a 10 out of 10 and the uh, single color card is a 5 out of 10? Right. Then then maybe it makes more sense to take the 10 out of 10 and to look for cards in that color but not force it. This is where draft is really interesting because then what if pick two, there's a card that's in the same color as your 10, but it's a five and there's a card that's a seven in a different color. This is why there's no easy formula, but the idea is to constantly be weighting these things against each other, especially in the early picks. Because once you're committed, you shouldn't be looking to switch like too late because then there's not enough uh, rest of draft for you to get rewarded for that switch. But over the first four or five picks of a draft, you're trying to weight all of these things constantly. So uh, an example that really helped me get get this point and a, a trap I used to fall into was, okay, let's say you're f- after five picks, you have three three blue cards, in, in, including like a bomb. Like you're pretty pretty sure you want to be blue. And two two white cards, one of which is good, one of which is is, is, is pretty good, whatever. And, there, and your sixth pick, you see a, a very good red card, like a first pick, first to second pick quality red card. You know, think like lightning direct strike or shock or, or something like that. Like not a bomb, but like direct current or command the storm or something right, like that. Right, exactly. 
Um, but again, set aside Ravnica because the color combination doesn't matter here. Uh, and you see like a mediocre white card. It used to be that I would look at that and say like, well, this one red card is better than this white card I would take. But this red card is worse than all three white cards put together if I took the white card. Because it's very easy to think like, yes, one red card is good, but these three white cards, including one that's on par with this red card, is better. But the what you're talking about, Ben, especially in pick six, pack one, is I'm not taking that lightning strike because of uh, how good lightning strike is solely. I'm taking it because it also implies future lightning strikes and shocks and whatever other, you know, prodigal pyromancers, whatever other good red cards are there. Whereas I'm not really getting a sign that there's a good, that white is open. I first yeah. picked a white, I set first or second picked a white card, third picked a white card, took two blue cards, haven't actually gotten past any good white cards. So it's not comparing just what's in front of you. It's also the future. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to predict the future. Yeah, that's definitely true. And it, it's not only that. It's also because in pick seven, right? Let's say the pack has a good white card. Then what did you do? You missed out on a moderate white playable. Who cares? You don't. You didn't switch to red. Now you just take that white card and you have three good blue cards and three good white cards and you miss one medium white playable. But let's say it has a good red card and it doesn't have any white cards. If you took that white card pick six and you passed that shock or direct current or whatever... Now pick seven, now you're facing no white cards and you're only facing like a medium red card, but a solid playable. Uh, what it, now you don't even have options, basically. Whereas if you had took that lightning strike and you get uh, you know a solid red playable pick seven, now you can take that. Now you've got two good red cards, uh, two two good white cards, and your three blue cards, and you just see what's their pick eight and you get to see what's their pick one, pack two. Some drafts, like you just, you know what you are the whole way in pack one. That's great. You're seeing it the whole time. You cut it off the whole time. But a lot of drafts go exactly for me, actually, the way we're describing this example. I'll have one color I'm pretty committed to. And then I'll have two colors that I have like three cards in one, two in the other. And I actually kind of like that. Uh, I would prefer, of course, the perfect easy mode draft. But I actually kind of like that because then going to pack two, I feel like I have more broken rares I can see out of the pack and get past me, let's say, maybe second pick. It has to be really early. But, you know, you get the best cards when out of your fresh pack before anybody else gets a chance. You know, you're going to first pick a better card on average than you're going to second pick. You're going to second pick a better card on average than you're going to third pick. So I actually kind of think another one of the advantages of kind of staying open in the middle of pack one, especially with your second color, is then going into pack two when you're cracking a pack where you get first choice out of it or you're getting past a pack that only one card is missing from. You might have three colors, four colors that you can find a broken rare from uh, instead of just two. Yeah, and that, that's, that's a huge amount of power. Uh, another thing to note is in this example, if you passed on taking the red card, you just shipped your, the person to your left a seventh pick lightning strike. They're, they're not going to ignore that. So you potentially made it harder to, to, to get into red, even if you then take red cards afterwards. Right. And so I think that the key is to just never view yourself as committed to something until the point becomes kind of clear that dropping that is going to be too much. The reward for dropping that is never going to outdo dropping it. Like once you have four or five cards in a color that are good and uh, a broken card or a first pickable card, if you switch, are you really likely to mount a better deck than if you had just stuck it out with that? But when it's so, one, one card, forget about it. Who cares? Yeah. And, and, and again, we all know that there's no hard and fast rule, but so you say, you're saying like in the like four to six card plus one really good card range is a, is a decent place to look at it. And yeah. then, and then what, then like what near the end, like middle of pack two, you should probably know what you're doing. Yeah. I would say that, like you said, definitely no hard and fast rule, but it's pretty rare that by like pick four pack two, I don't know what colors I'm going to be. By right. then, I almost always am locked in. I might not know whether I'm going to splash yet or something like that, but I have a pretty good idea by like pick four, pack two, almost every draft. Uh, so one really important thing here, which can be pretty tough, is you want to stay open. Like you said, you, you don't, don't ever feel like you're committed. One thing that people have trouble with, like the fear of loss is a real thing. You need to be ready. To, you need to be heartless. You need to be ready to always just abandon cards you've taken. Like oh, yeah. you're not... You're not blue red. You're just taking cards. And yeah, maybe, maybe you did first pick an awesome blue card. That doesn't mean you have to play it. And often your deck was going to be better if you don't, but it's painful to, to give it away. It also, you also can't look back at uh, previous picks and feel like, Oh, if only I had done this, it'd be a lot better because let's say you first picked a red card. Second pick 
uh, you took another red card. Third pick, you took a white card. Fourth pick, you took a good white card over uh, over a good blue card, right? Because that's that's obviously correct there. But then you end up blue anyway. You can't keep thinking about that blue card you passed. It doesn't, it doesn't do you any good. But a lot of people do see that. I see this all the time, like when people comment on my videos or when I'm covered. Like the, the picks that I make, most people understand. And then there'll be a pick usually where like I'll have like two blue cards and a white card. And then pick four, I'll get past a pack that has like the best card in the pack is red. And there's a fine white playable. And I'll take the red card. And people will go, be like, I don't get that pick. Like, I got everything else, but I didn't understand that. Like, you are, you are already drafting blue white. And I'm like, well, I'm not drafting blue white. I'm drafting. I'm never drafting anything. I'm just drafting. And at this point, I have two blue cards and one white card. Uh, that's such a mediocre white card. I'm not abandoning uh, white at this moment. I'm just taking the best card because pack, pack five, I don't know whether the best card in the pack is going to be red or white. And I feel like there's more upside to taking this red card than there is downside. And then, of course, the times that people don't understand it, they get the most comments about it are like, then pick five, I'll take a white card. Pick six, I'll take a blue card. Pick seven, I'll take a white card. I'll never take another red card again the rest of the draft. And I'll, I'll get, why did you take that red card pick for? It made no sense. You were dra- you drafted blue white the whole draft. There were some red playables after that, but you didn't switch. And I'm like, I didn't take the card because I was trying to switch. I took the card because it was substantially better than the white card in the pack. And I only had one white card. And I didn't know I was going to go on to see a bunch of white and not red for the rest of that pack one because I'm not psychic. I, I just took that card because it was better just in case I saw red the rest of the way. So uh, one of the one of the things that people tend to do, especially, uh, you know, as, as we talked about signals, is they think that if they cut a color, then... Because they're going to get it in pack two, it's okay if the, the, the color isn't open in pack one. And that generally doesn't work out great, especially now since we're, we almost, uh, I think almost exclusively draft three packs of the same set. So there's not even set differences to take into account. Yeah. And I think also people put too much stock into what the person they're passing it was going to take. Everyone has wildly different, uh, let's say card evaluations. So if you're passing to a good friend or something and you just know they love the green card in the pack, sure, they're probably going to take it. But you may be thinking to yourself, oh, I didn't pass any good green cards in this draft. Meanwhile, the green cards you did pass that you think aren't good, the person you're passing just thinks are great and is just, you know, lapping them up one after another. So I think that you don't want to put too much stock into what you pass. You want to put a lot more stock into what's being passed to you because even though the same principle can occur – Cards are being taken out of those packs, whereas you're trying to predict like what the person behind you is going to take. And that depends on what they've already took, which you have no idea what their first pick was. Their second pick may have been determined by their first pick. You don't know their card evaluations at all. So I just, I don't know. I just try and focus a lot more on uh, what I'm seeing in front of me and trying to figure out which colors are clearly being underdrafted because the cards are just coming and coming or uh, just take the best cards that I, th- that I think are the best cards so that I'm not that concerned even with what other people are doing. I just get the best set of cards I can get, I guess. <laughs> An example that may resonate with people who draft a lot in stores that I'm sure you've seen, Jimin, because both of us have done a ton of those kind of drafts. At the end of the draft, you, you look to the person to your left, you're like, you're blue white, right? And they're just like, no, I'm black red. You're like, how could you not be blue white? We passed you all this, blah, 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 blah. And it's just like, they live in a different world than you. You don't know what they first picked, second, or you can per- you can guess what they second and third picked, but often you're just going to be completely off and the things you think that are happening are just not happening. Yeah. And the most common answer to that question, when you say, how could you be a uh, black, red and up blue white is they just first picked a black, red mythic or something. And <laughs> yeah. maybe it was right for them to draft blue, white and switch, but not everybody drafts the hard way. And even if it was uh, right, theoretically, it, it, they just stuck to their card because they liked it. There were car- maybe there were cards in the next couple packs that you didn't think were that good, but that they like, and they were just, they just felt like they could stick to it. So I, I just think overall, if you read the if you read what's underdrafted, what's coming picks four, five, six, seven, and uh, what's clearly not being cut off from you, that's going to put you in a good spot to have a good deck in virtually every single draft. Uh, I, I think I can count the number of train wrecks I've had in in the Pro Tour and stuff like on one hand. Like I almost always walk away from the draft saying either my deck's great or my deck's okay. It's it's fine because I got like enough playables and a good curve and synergy, but it's not great because I didn't get on commons and rares and some incredible power or anything. I mean, I, I can too. It, depending on when you start counting, I, I would say about four years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I've talked some about the, some of the. Ex- 
extremely bad picks I've made, and and those are those are good examples. Oh, uh, I'll, can I, can I talk about a little myth on that subject? Like, uh, yeah. So people always one of the times that uh, people criticize this that I think is completely wrong. People often will say to me. Uh, okay, but what if you need a 3-0? Because Magic tournaments reward yes, top finishes. Love that. Yeah, the Magic tournaments, like sometimes you don't need anything. You're just hoping to do well and your strategy is great, Ben, and you'll 2-1 almost every time because you'll never have a train wreck. But what happens when you need a 3-0? Then you have to go for it. Well, here's the thing. Firstly, you don't 2-1 every time drafting the hard way because it's Magic. Sometimes your opponent just draws well with their great decks and beats your good deck. But... You also don't necessarily 3-0 more by going for the best deck because the way magic works is not the better deck wins every time, like as if it were chess. And if your deck is a couple percent better than the opponents, like if you're a little bit better than your opponent in chess, you just get to win almost every time. That's not how magic works, right? If your deck, let's say you're me and you draft- No, sometimes you mold a four, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, that would never happen to anybody in the finals of a pro tour. But <laughs> let's let's say you're me, right? And you, and you always draft the hard way. And so you pretty much always have a okay to good deck. Just great at limited, just in the Hall of Fame. Yeah, it's a, I get it. I think you just claimed that you were both of those things. I mean, you just claimed you're great at limited, and we all know you're in the hole. But anyway. <laughs> wow, this works a lot better when I'm with Marshall. <laughs> but anyway, so like basically when you draft the way I'm drafting, you're probably not going to have the best deck of the pod very often. That much is true. There's going to be somebody who just sticks to their colors and gets there, right? But when you play them, you don't just auto lose to them because their deck is better than yours. You have a good deck. You have a fine curve. Your mana is good. So you're 45% against them. It's not like if their deck is better than yours, they beat you so you can't 3-0 because you never drafted the best deck in the pod. So let's say you draft the easy way. Let's say half the time your deck comes out to be the best in the pod, which it probably won't, but let's say it does. And the other half of the time, it's it's really bad. That means... How many drafts can you 3-0? You, when you have the best deck in the pod, you don't 3-0. You now are 55% against the second best deck in the pod, and you're 60% against the third and fourth best deck in the pod. So you're not 3 0 even over half the time when you get the best deck in the pod. And the other half the time, you have some awful deck and a very low chance to 3-0. Meanwhile, with my strategy, you always have a good deck. So you just have like, let's call it 65% or... 60% or, and then 45% or, or 65% or 55% or 45%. Or, I'm making up the numbers clearly. But the point is you don't just get a better shot at 3-0 by going for the best deck or a train wreck. You get, I think you get a better shot at 3-0 pods by just always drafting a good deck. And if you look at uh, the stats guy, I, I forget his name on Twitter, but he, he AGLV. Yeah, he tweeted uh, most draft trophies since X time or whatever. And I'm, I wasn't number one, but it's a list of great players and I'm up there and I've always drafted the hard way. And I have, I'm like tied with somebody at 16 and first is like 18 or 19 or something over this period. And I'm always drafting the hard way. I'm never thinking I need a 3-0, so I'm going to jam for the nuts. I'm always just reading the draft and switching and drafting what's open. And yet somehow I still, am, you know, let's call it fifth or seventh or something in 3-0s. Because if you always have a good deck, 45 percenters happen. When I play the deck that's better than mine, I just often beat them because that's how magic works. And they were just a very small favorite. Whereas I never go into these matches where I stand almost no chance to win because my deck is unplayable. Sorry, I know that yeah, ended up being a bit of a rant, but that's just a really important myth. I think I need. Well, no, I think I, I think that's true. And, and for those those out there who who play constructed, it's when people say like, "Well, oh, I need to six us, so I'm going to pick this high variance combo deck." It's like doesn't really work that way. You you should just pick the deck with the highest win percentage. And yeah, because that's that, what's that going to give you the biggest chance to Yeah, you're just up. envisioning like, oh, everything going right all day and you winning with that deck. But just as easily, if you're playing Jund, when your opponent, when you play against the high variance combo deck, things could just go wrong for them, which is effectively the same as things going right for you when you're playing that deck. So you, you just get them, you have the highest chance to 6-0 by giving yourself the most total win percent, not by turning up the variance. Yeah. So one of the things we've talked about a lot here is uh, switching, right? So part of what makes this draft strategy viable, and I believe is, is a pretty important component to it, you have to do your homework. You have to know what's going on in the format because you need to know what cards you have and what colors actually make sense to switch into. Because, well, to use guilds as an example, if you start by drafting like blue, and let's say that's the one color that you're like pretty sure you're going to be. You, you open like a dream eater and you got past, you know, chemistry's insight or something like that. You don't have four colors you can switch to. You have two. You have black and you have, and you have red. And you need to know that because you need to know that like 
a six pick luminous bonds, you might still want to take it, maybe splash it, whatever, but it's not as easy as I'm just going to be blue white because that's just not a thing you can do. So you actually have to know, you know, the set by set breakdown of like which cards and which decks are, are, are good and are available because it also has stuff to do like when you're, when you're drafting, uh, is it aggro? Knowing which of the cards are also good and is it control in case you have to audible that way or turn into Grixis control or something like that. You need to know which cards you're abandoning and which cards you're not. Because, you know, you, you, you talked about Leapfrog, right? Being good in is it aggro? If you end up Grixis control, Leapfrog is pretty bad. Yeah. You so don't it's, don't you don't actually get to keep it. Right. You don't actually get to keep it even if you're the same color. So you need to know what you're switching into and out of so you can make the best decisions. And in, in Guilds of Ravnica, of course, that's the, the five, not only the five guilds, but also the three color combinations that are plausible because, you know, like I, I found that, uh, Salt Eye, so green, black, blue, and Grixis, uh, red, black, blue are both a lot more viable than some of the other three color combinations. Sure. I think that, uh, in guild formats, that you, I mean, you're still drafting along the lines of drafting the hard way, but I kind of have a little bit different of a formula. Uh, I don't stick to anything, but I think what happens m most drafts is I'm looking for what color is kind of open while taking powerful gold cards and, and just powerful one color cards if I can get them. And then I kind of try and hone in on one of the two guilds in that color or just play the three color deck, uh, depending on what I see. And for, you know, normal formats, like the average format, uh, like I mentioned earlier, the 10 two-color pairs are generally all designed to be draftable. You usually one or two lag behind the others, but there are almost any, almost any combination of 23 cards that are good from those two colors will make a deck. So you're, you're not ending up in a spot where blue-green's undraftable. Blue-green actually is probably fine. So if you're drafting blue, black, but a just ton of green cards get past you, you could switch to blue-green if you wanted to. Yeah, guild formats are definitely not the norm. In most formats, like no. you said, all 10 are fine. If not, at least nine are fine and one maybe is unplayable or eight are good and one is fine and one is unplayable. But normally you can switch to just about anything. And then, you know, going past guilds, there's also like uh, clans, like in clans that are here, the three color combinations or shards. Like there are, there are a lot of variations from set to set, but the point is, if you really want to maximize your chances and if you want to be able to really enact this, you do have to know what those are and you do have to know how, how it works. Like you have to have a lot more format knowledge because if I were to, to, to recommend a novice player how they would draft, it would not be this way. Yeah. Like you want to learn to play. That's the eventual goal. But if you don't know a lot of this knowledge, you're, you're actually going to end up with the worst deck if you do this. Yeah, I remember like maybe last year sometime, Andre wrote an article drafting the medium way. And it was uh, basically saying, like, he wasn't disagreeing that drafting the hard way is better if you're well-practiced and if you're really good at draft. But he was just saying, like, if you're not well-practiced and you can't do a ton of drafts or whatever, here's, like, this other way to draft that will give you effective decks, like, a lot of the time. And uh, I think he thought I probably wouldn't like it or something. And I thought it was a good article because, like, yeah, like, drafting the hard way, I think I might have said something like this in the article. If not, I've said it 10 times since. It's like 100x harder and you get to win like 5% more and it's probably not even that high. You know what I mean? Like it, it's better. And if you, when you play games, your goal is not to use as little brain power as possible. I mean, maybe some people's is, but mine is to think as much as possible to embrace and enjoy all the strategy the game has to offer, right? That's why we play strategy games. So I don't mind if something is, you know, 10, 20 times harder to give me two, three, five percent more win rate. I want that because I want to I want the game to be as challenging as it can be. Like I want to play the game the best I can play it. If you don't want that, if you just, you know, want to go in and have a playable deck, uh, but you don't want to practice draft a bunch and you don't want uh, let's say to give yourself this challenge. There's absolutely nothing wrong with saying blue and white are my favorite colors, or I'll draft whatever broken rare I open. You can you can win that way as you did for years before you kind of learned to draft the hard way. When you get there, but there's just going to be a lot of times you don't get there and your deck is really bad, and that's going to produce a lower total win rate than if you have a, a playable to good deck in virtually every draft. Yeah, and I'll link Andre's article because I think it is a good example of this. Uh, it also has to do with the time component where let's say you, you qualified for an RPTQ and the top eight's draft, but you're, you, you just don't have enough time to practice the draft a lot. Figuring out like for guilds, let's say you like drafting 
three of the five guilds a lot more and you're a lot more practiced, it might make sense for you to just ignore the other two guilds and just draft the ones you actually know how to draft because you'll lose more percentage the right. other way. Now, in a perfect world, it would be better if you could go do 100 drafts in each of the other two guilds, know how to draft <laughs> right. them well too, and then you can just weight your picks just a little bit towards the guilds that are better because <clears throat> draft finds a natural balance. People draft the best guilds. So if, if you're going to be one of the worst, the only person at your table playing the worst guild or one of three people playing the best guild or one of two people playing the medium guilds, that's normally going to roughly balance out. So in a perfect world, you learn how to draft everything so that you can draft whatever cards you open and get passed and, and is available to you. But that's not always the world we live in. Sometimes you only have time for 10 drafts. Sometimes you only have time for a few articles and a few practice drafts before you're going to play in a tournament. So I'm not in any way against drafting the medium way. But if you want the best way to draft, what I think is the way that you can play the game to its hardest, fullest, and to give yourself the highest chance to win, then I think that's drafting the hard way. Yeah. And, and so leaning more into the format knowledge, it also has to do with card specifics. Like I've got some examples from Guilds of Ravnica, uh, both Wishcoin Crab and Dowser of Lights, four mana, two, five, and five mana, four, five are just way better than they look, right? These are just vastly overperforming compared to their stats in a vacuum in a random set. Yeah. And it's just because the creatures happen to be small in this format. And you know, all that stuff, is, it might seem obvious in retrospect, like, yeah, of course, Dowser's just so much bigger and everything else. A lot of the common removal spells deal four damage instead of five, like Hypothesizzle. And you're, you know, so clearly it makes sense to, that Dowser would be good. But that wasn't obvious day one. And it's the sort of thing you do have to learn, whether it's by, again, reading articles, listening to podcasts, watching streams, or, or playing yourself. Yeah, definitely. But knowing that stuff can really help change things because, yes, you can never predict what other people are doing, but... Even if other people think Dowser sucks, getting one seventh has good implications for you. One of the way one of the ways I see a lot of sometimes even relatively good drafters go wrong is if Dowser was bad in the format before, it's bad most of the time. They'll just assume it's bad instead of trying to learn that format. I, I don't think that, I mean this is kind of different from drafting the hard way. Of course, there's overlap because there's only so much going on in draft. But I, I think actually I wrote a, another article that I thought was pretty good uh, this year kind of talking about evaluating the cards for each format. And I think that that's also a really important thing to do and a really big pitfall. Yeah, and you, you, some of the stuff doesn't come out till quite late into the format. That There's definitely been undervalued cards all over the place. Uh, some of it you can tell relatively early, but it's important to know stuff like dead, Deadweight versus Deadly Visit. I, actually, where do you fall on that? Uh, I like Deadly Visit. I think, uh, I mean, I think they're really close. So I actually don't think that pick matters very much. Like if you literally told me you were going to give me one of the two, I wouldn't really care. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, that's an answer. Like th them being as effectively tied also also is something that's worth noting. What do you like? I, I like Deadweight more. I find myself in controlling Demir decks often enough that I found Deadweight to be really good. And... The, the fact that I splash Hypothesis on a lot of Demir decks also means that Deadly Visit's at a bit less of a premium. Yeah, I don't love splashing Hypothesis on those decks. I do it sometimes. But I do agree that Dowser's good and Watcher is great. So that already gives you two playable fives at common. Yeah. So there are some exceptions to this, and I actually want to talk about them. And it, it, it'll let you have a good rant, too. Uh, sometimes there are cards that actually do kind of go against this strategy, Right. Like I'm thinking cards like Glorybringer or like Multani, cards that are so un unrealistically good that even in a color that's cut, it might be better to play blue-red when red is like completely cut, but you have Glorybringer and four other red cards rather than being blue-white, even when blue-white's open. Yeah, so I mean, when you look at that, it doesn't undo the underlying logic. It doesn't prove the strategy bad or anything. It actually fits into the strategy. It just means you are going to draft that color, and here's why. So you first pick Glorybringer, you second pick a white card, third pick you're looking at a playable red common and a better green common. The thing is, Glorybringer plus the average red cards you're going to get through the rest of the draft, even if red is being overdrafted, is going to give you a higher chance to win than that green common and the, rest, the average green cards you're going to get for the rest of the draft, even if green is being underdrafted, because Glorybringer is just so good. So yeah, you're not going to quote unquote, draft the hard way, you're going to stick it out when you get Glorybringer. But it doesn't thwart the underlying logic. It's just that 
the, re the average rest of the draft finding the open color is not going to be more rewarding than the average rest of the draft not finding the open color if you have a game-winning bomb like Glory Brenner that wins the game like 80-plus percent of the time when you cast it. So there should you wish there were more Glory Brenners then? I hate Glory Brenner. <laughs> And when Ben says Glorybringer, he also means Tetsamok and Rotani. Oh, yeah. and, I think one of the, you know, the most the fun things you can do in, in draft is towards the end of the format when you don't really need to practice and you're just playing strictly for fun is just take out the rares, just draft and play play drafts and just don't play with the rares. <laughs> I, I I do think that there's some appeal to that, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I have a couple Glorybringers on my Magic Online account that I, I was pretty happy to open, so... I remember, I if I remember correctly, you opened a nice one for us in Team Super League, I think it was. Oh, I did. That was my first pick. Uh, so that pretty much wraps up like that main topic, unless there's something else you want to add. No, I mean, it's a great topic. I'm really glad you brought it up. It is the article I'm most proud of in my entire Magic career. Uh, I think it's really every single person who likes draft should read it. Uh, just try and it's not only so you can draft that way. It's so you can understand what you're trying to accomplish in draft. It's a it's it's what I would call like a fundamental draft theory article where you kind of understand how you're creating value pick by pick, how you're trying to give yourself the most total value you can. Yeah, and even if it's like it's the sort of thing that I find really interesting. Even if you're just looking for a way to encounter a new puzzle or a new game, this kind of opens the door for that too. Because the the goal isn't. Like, yes, the underlying goal of draft is generally to end up with the best deck you can. But if you break that down into smaller objectives, what we're saying when we talk about this is your objective is to find the open lane, whether that's a guild, colors, whatever, and maximize your value with every pick working towards that. And that's a different puzzle than a lot of people seem to be trying to solve when they draft. Yeah, that's a great way to say it. So we've got some uh, Q&A for you, Ben. Uh, thanks to the Patreon listeners, uh, there's a of course, a benefit to being on the Patreon. You get to send in questions when we have uh, special guests, even if they're impermanent. And Marshall will be back next week. Uh <laughs> so I have to ask you before we start with these questions, though. Is anybody going to top the best question from last time? What was the best question from last time? <laughs> you don't remember? <laughs> Who would I rather yeah. fight? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't remember who were the the two examples. It was I can either fight five uh, Gabby sized Hueys or one Huey sized Gabby. Right. I I assume you said you'd rather fight the one. Yes, right? of course. Yeah. Well, that is a good question, and I guess we just answered it. So that's a bonus question. <laughs> um, all right, Ben. What are your top three sets to draft? This is from Peter. Uh, your top three sets to draft, and why? Uh, my favorite set of all time is Champions. Nice. Me, me, me and you, we're like one of the lone few who likes that. Yeah, set. I just think like uh, Splice and Soul Shift make for these grindy games where the cards don't do that much right away. So you don't get punished for being stuck on lands or being a little flooded. You have time to kind of draw out of it. And uh, there's just a lot of synergy, a lot of grinding. Not very many cards were a lot more powerful than the others. There's just a lot of removal. I mean, when you start talking about the second and third set, it just got truly spectacular. I mean, you have cards that they get a bonus if you have seven cards in hand. You get a, They get a bonus if you have more cards in hand than the opponent. I mean, it's just all-out resource war. <laughs> it's just great. From a game design perspective, that last mechanic is one of the worst mechanics of all time. Well, when you say from a game design perspective, you mean because it creates like a lot of feel-bad or like a lot of things you have to like pay – like restrict you, you don't get to do the So, so the, 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 to give you an example of card text, it's like if you have more cards in your hand, this five mana four three gets has plus three plus three. So it, part of the reason is incentive to not play your cards isn't fun. It's fun to play cards. Second is this changes multiple times throughout the turn. Like I mean, I've seen this happen. You attack with your seven six. They like block with a three three. Then you play a land post combat. And your so creature here's dies. the thing. I know I know what you're saying is true from <laughs> purely for a lot of people from a game design perspective. But for me, like it's not fun to play your cards. If if you're just gonna auto play your card every turn, then that's not fun. What's fun to me in a strategy game is the strategy. So what's fun to me is thinking about, hey, maybe it's not even right to play my card this turn because there's this common whoever has more cards in hand, it gets this meaningful bonus and I have one in my deck. They're playing those colors. They may have one. Maybe this turn, I just shouldn't even cast this card for that reason. Now you have all this strategy, all this, all this decision to think about instead of just playing your card every turn that 
So I don't know. Everybody enjoys different things, but I, I think what gives you more decisions and harder decisions is more fun. Oh, totally. And, and look, from a personal point of view, I also love champions. So I'm not, I'm not criticizing that. It is funny using it when I'm wearing a different hat. I can see it and kind of wince a little bit. Uh, besides champions, what do you got? Uh, there's champions is my number one. There's definitely a, a handful of sets that I consider really good. Uh, I don't know if I've ever thought about which one's second and which one's third because, you know, people always ask what's your favorite set. Nobody asks, Oh, and then what's your second favorite and what's your third favorite? But, uh, set, sets that I also really liked were time spiral for very similar reasons. <laughs> um morph is awesome uh like uh suspend is cool like i, th- I think it had like flashback and stuff which was awesome we're, 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 like time throws on my list too but we're, we're, th- th- this really says something about both of us ben that we're really running through the list of the least successful magic sets well <laughs> not some people just want to cast their cards not everybody wants the hardest strategical decisions they can get at all times yeah yeah for uh, sure I for sure i, I love here how about this what about a fan favorite dominaria yeah, I, loves I, dominaria. I love dominaria too i'm totally in that camp I, i've called on twitter multiple times dominaria the best set that isn't modern masters that they've made since i started playing magic regularly again in 2000. So the best set Chion's worked on, basically. <laughs> uh, I don't know which sets Chion's worked on. <laughs> Neither do I, honestly. But, All but right, that's a long uh, time. I started playing in regularly in like 2008 or nine, and I think Dominaria is their best non-modern master set since that point. So, uh, Ben Lewis has a slightly different take on this question. It's, are there any, just like core sets are designed to get new players in the game of Magic, are there any sets that you would consider good at, good sets to get new players into drafting? Um, well, you would definitely want something that's kind of what you were talking about. All 10 uh, color combinations are playable, kind of uh, like a nuts and bolts type draft format where like creatures are good, pump spells are good, and you can play any colors. So I- I'll have to think about it. Um, I-, I have a suggestion. Uh, Magic Origins. I thought if you could get Origins packs, Origins was one of the most streamlined, just is that the one? play to the board, the one not, black, not super white, fast, not super slow. Like vampires and, and synergy. Yeah, it had some small amounts of synergy going on, but it wasn't like overburdening. And I thought it really did teach draft fundamentals pretty well. I, I believe it. I don't really remember Origins that well, to be honest. Um, let's see. I see. Spencer asks, uh, it's been said on the show that playing limited makes one better at magic, including constructed by honing skills like decision making, card evaluation, and the like. For those of us who enjoy limited most, is there anything to learn from playing constructed or should we stick to the clearly superior limited? You know, to be honest, if you aren't interested in constructed, then no, you're not going to learn anything about limited from playing constructed, really. Uh, I mean, maybe there's some aspects of combo and stuff that don't come up that often in limited and people are just playing combo decks and constructed. But the thing is they come up in limited. Like if you're drafting that format, you should find out about spider spawning or burning vengeance or whatever. So really I think the, the, the reason you get better at lim- at uh, constructed by playing limited is because when you only play like an aggro deck and constructed, you're under this mindset, you should always be attacking. And then you don't realize that turn you should slam on the brakes. Whereas in limited, you constantly have to be on the offense, then the defense, then the offense again. You can't just, even if you're a little more aggressive than your opponent, I always quote Owen on this, like all the decks are really just different shades of mid range. You might want to call them aggro or control because they're a little bit left or right of center. But ultimately, they're really pretty close to center. Whereas in Constructed, it's the opposite. In Constructed, there's mid-range decks, but a lot of decks are just very aggressive or very controlling. So anyways, short answer, no. I don't think if Limited is definitely better, and if you don't need to play Constructed, if you have if that's not something you, you want to improve at, just play Limited. You're not going to get better at Limited by playing Constructed. Uh this is, a, this is a good one, Ben. This is from Dylan. It says, uh, hi, Ben. Thanks for giving us your time. I've seen on Twitter that you've been playing a lot of Arena. Well, I've been absolutely loving Arena and think it's the future of Magic. I'm concerned that playing so much of Arena's less skilled bot drafted drafts is going to cause my Magic brain to atrophy. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Arena in general and also whether you think playing a lot of Arena is helpful in improving a player's skill or is it dangerous? So... I don't know that my decks on Arena have been better than my decks on Magic Online. I've done uh, a lot more Arena drafts for Guilds of Ravnica than I have Magic Online drafts, but I've done probably 
30 maybe, maybe 25 Magic Online drafts. And I've done, I don't know, probably 100 plus Arena drafts. And uh, I, I haven't really noticed my decks just being substantially better. You might see uh, something more surprising more often. Like you might get that seventh pick disinformation campaign more often on Arena. But overall, when you find the open color on Magic Online, you get those picks too. Like I can remember drafts that draft videos I made where I got three green seekers or uh, where I was just getting seventh pick, first pickable cards, and that's on Magic Online. I think basically the box might draft a little differently than humans, but your total deck quality is only a little bit better, and your opponent's is too. So I think it's perfectly fine practice. I, I think you're going to get better at Magic. I think you're getting valid and good limited practice. I don't really personally see the problem. Well, I, I think that a, a lot of people have that same question, so I'm, I'm glad to get your take on it. Uh, Antonio says, hi, Ben. Has your evaluation of the guilds in Guild of Ravnica stayed the same since the beginning, or has it has it shifted as the format's advanced? Um, I mean, I thought the green ones were the worst two right away, and I still think that. Uh, I think they're both playable. I draft Celestia, I draft Golgari, if that's what I'm seeing, but I think they're the worst guilds. Um, I don't really remember my day one rankings of the other three. I think also this becomes hard to answer because let's say other people are drafting Boros a lot, then I'll just naturally not find myself drafting Boros as much because it's just not open as much. Uh, but I think that the best guild is probably Demir, maybe is it, and then Boros is, could be third. But honestly, if Boros was being underdrafted and you can get the right cards and Boros could be the best, like, I think the basically the green guild should only have one player in each guild per pod. And then I think uh, Boros, Demir, and Izzet should all have about two. And uh, as a follow-up, Antonio asks, what, what is your favorite guild? Demir. Uh, I, I like the Izzet decks when they get there, but they don't always get there. Whereas when you draft Demir Surveil with like the t Dark Blade Agent and uh, the minus three, minus O and... Uh, Watcher and Deadly Visit. And, I mean, both common black removal are just so good for you in uh, the minus two, minus two, and Deadly Visit. And then Watcher's great. Uh, the, the, the blue, black, gold uh, the common is just amazing. Either Takedown is such good removal for a deck that's sometimes trying to race, other times playing purely defensive. Ben, if you're going to be a full-time content creator, you got to nail down the card names. <laughs> I mean, I think the blue black gold card is either Takedown or something like that. <laughs> there's Artful, Artful Takedown, take and then there's Dark, dark Blade Agent. Dark, I said Dark Blade Agent, didn't I? What did I call it? Uh, I don't remember. But Dead Awaits the minus two, minus two card, just just, just for reference. Yeah, I mean, to be fair to me, it's it's not like this isn't the second, third, fourth time they printed that. So how should I know the name? <laughs> uh, so... Let's see. Uh, Carter has a good question here. It says, uh, hi, Ben and Marshall. I don't know what Marshall has to do with this podcast, but uh, I recently won a limited PPTQ. Thank you, uh, Marshall and mostly Luis. No, he, he just said both of us. Uh, however, the RPTQ I received an invite to is standard and will take place only a week and a half after the new set, Ravnica Allegiance. How do you and other pros on Team Channel Fireball go about selecting a deck and preparing for a meta game for a tournament that happens right after uh, the latest set has arrived? Actually, he's curious about both standard and limited. Well, first, let me say condolences on having to go from limited to standard. <laughs> yeah, that, that's unfortunate. But uh, other than that, I pretty much always prepare in the Magic Online leagues. Hopefully, it'll be the Arena leagues or whatever on Arena from here forward. Uh, I think that online metagames and players just kind of move quicker than in-person ones. I feel like in-person ones kind of advance by the weekend and online ones advance by the minute. Like literally, it might be by the hour or by the game oh, yeah. or however you want to look at it, but they just advance so much quicker. So if you have something and it's a week and a half after the set comes out, but the set is hitting uh, online that weekend, I would just jam online as, as much as you can, as much time as you have available for that week. And, and I can kind of add to this because I too am technically a pro in Team Channel Fireball. Uh, I, I would pay, especially if you have a short time period and haven't played a lot, uh, practicing the pra picking a deck and practicing it is generally going to be higher value than switching a bunch. I've seen that happen to even pros who are very good at magic 
you know, we, we know the people on our team who bounce around tons, right? And I feel like they generally are lowering their EV as opposed to just playing a deck 50 matches rather than trying to pick the deck that's one or two percent win percentage higher. You're calling yourself practically a pro now. Were you a couple mulligans away from winning the last pro tour? <laughs> I, I guess technically. Maybe I'm not completely washed up. <laughs> well, if the next pro tour is cube, then, then, I, then I'm set. Oh, wait, sorry. There's no more pro tours. Uh, the next mythic uh, challenge or whatever. The name doesn't matter. The next big, sweet magic tournament with a large prize pool. Uh, but yes, j- jokes aside, I do think that uh, worry less about about trying to, to squeak out every win percentage of by in deck selection. Worry more about knowing how to play the deck you're going to play. That's just, just I think that's just generally good. Advice. I definitely agree with that. Also, um, oh, this is a really good one. Uh, Joseph asks, hey, I know that while it's typically beneficial to choose to play first in limited and of course constructed, that it's sometimes smart to choose to draw first. Uh, an example from Guild of Ravnica is if you have a controlling Demir is a deck. My question is, when is it smart to choose to play first with that same deck after you've seen your, depending on what you've seen from your opponent? Okay, here's the thing. I'll try and make this as concise as possible. No, no, you're not here for concise. Just, just, just lay into it because I know this is a passion of yours. Yeah, like people don't draw first nearly enough, but like it can be a big mistake to draw first. So. <laughs> I think that the person on the draw is in a small advantage in a lot of games of limited. A lot of decks versus each other, a lot of matchups. Because ultimately, decks curves just aren't that good in limited. Decks mana just aren't that perfect in limited. Having an extra card on one of each of your turns is a subtle advantage that it's hard to realize how how, uh, meaningful it is because you never know which card you wouldn't have had and things like that. But when it's turn two and you have nine cards instead of uh, eight, That's a lot. That's whatever, 12% more cards or whatever. That's a lot. And that's often going to be the difference between casting a two drop or not. If you have a deck with three two drops, not often, but a meaningful amount. And it's like that with everything because it's it's an extra card to have the land to make the drop and the two drop to play. And, And then on turn three, it's the same thing. It's an extra card to have land three, to have the right colors and to have a three drop to play. But the, so here's the thing. I think if you really get these concepts of when to play and when to draw, you can draw first a lot in limited. I draw first a lot in limited and a lot of my opponents even choose to play after seeing me draw. But, and I, I never get that. If, uh, but if you play somebody much better than you, you should certainly choose whatever they chose because you should assume that they're choosing correctly. But I digress. That's just something that tilts me. But, <laughs> but as far as if you're sitting at home and you're like, well, I think I should draw first here then you probably should, and it's probably a small advantage to draw first. But it could be a big mistake, and it's almost never a big mistake to play first. So I think what's really important is to not worry a ton about when it's right to draw, but to worry uh, more about when it's right to play. If one deck is a lot slower than the other, but don't think more defensive, think slower, then it's really important for both decks to choose to play when they play each other. So where I'll often see people go wrong is they'll play first with their aggro deck versus another aggro or control deck where the decks are the same speed and blocking isn't hard. If I've got dead weights and two mana O fours and you've got one mana two ones and two mana two twos, what is accomplished by you being on the play? You play your two one, I dead weight. You play your two two, I play my O four. It's there's no advantage to being on the play. And in that example, both players should choose to draw. But let's say I have a slow, powerful late game deck, a slow, powerful control deck. I don't have dead weights. Maybe I have a few two drops that aren't that great at blocking, but I've got a four mana sweeper like we see in Constructed, or I've got a uh, powerful four and five and six drops and that you're hoping to kind of swarm through and use a pump spell or removal or a bounce spell and kind of keep me on my back foot. And you're trying to win before I establish my more powerful late game. In that case, both players want to choose to play. But in the case where both players have cheap cards that are just going to trade off and block and have no trouble blocking each other, then both players want to choose to draw. Now, when you're if the creatures can't block each other, if it's a race, like, for example, Zendikar, I think I know is a long time ago now, is the best example of this, where uh, because of landfall, creatures basically just couldn't block each other effectively, then you want to be on the play. Because if I attack you first, then you attack me back. Then I attack you first, then you attack me back. On average, I'm going to kill you first. And you're not going to get to attack me back and kill me back because you're already dead. 
So the biggest times you want to play first are when it's a race or when one deck is way slower than the other. But I'm talking slower in casting costs, not in how aggressive or defensive it is. If, if, if my deck is filled with cheap removal and your deck is filled with cheap aggressive creatures, you should choose to draw first against me. If my deck is filled with powerful five and six mana cards and I don't have much cheap removal, my deck's kind of slow, and your deck is filled with cheap aggressive creatures, we should both choose to play first. I mean, I, I shouldn't have to say that every time, but clearly you have different information. So sometimes you think it's right to play and your opponent thinks it's right to draw. But ultimately, it's either an advantage for both players to be on the play or both players to be on the draw because you're playing against each other. It can't actually be right for you to play and them to draw. Yeah, I had, a, I had a good example of this uh, back in Rise of the Eldrazi, which was a format that's really heavily slanted towards drawing first. And I played against Frank Karsten, and this was when Frank hadn't played a ton of Magic recently. He was just getting back into it. He had just made the Hall of Fame and was, you know, starting to go to some Pro Tours. And he won the die roll. He chose to play. Uh, he beat me. I chose to draw. I beat him. Game three, he's, before we played, he's like, I haven't played as much of this format as you have. I'm going to choose to draw because you, you chose to draw a game two and you're more likely to be right than me. And that's so <laughs> logical and so smart. And you see so little of that. Yeah. Cause it's also like Frank has also no ego when it comes to that kind of stuff. He's just like, yeah, you probably know what you're doing more than I will. And honestly, when I, it, I, I see this all the time when I, when Ben, when one of your opponents sits down across from you and in game two, you choose to draw and then, and then you win that game. I think your opponent should most of the time assume you know yeah, more than that, they do. And I, they I would think draw. so. I mean, I, I've played, I, I don't even want to make up a number anymore for how many hours of magic I've played. <laughs> just give it away how old I am. <laughs> you probably played at least a thousand hours, is my guess. I think you probably played at least a thousand hours, is my guess. Okay, I've probably played at least a thousand hours <laughs> in the past few months on Arena. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see. Let's take a look. Uh, we've got. Oh, this is a good one. This is a, a, a actually a common misconception. I don't want to. I don't want to lead the witness here. But uh, hi, Ben. Pick one, pack one. You see three strong cards that share an archetype. Would you pick one of them, or would you rather go for a different archetype, hoping that the people to your left will no longer compete with yeah, you? Yeah, I mean, we've all, we've already covered this a little. Of course, there's no hard and fast rule. It depends on how much worse that other card is than the best card in those archetypes and whatever. But ultimately, I don't really worry that much about what I'm passing. Uh, you don't know if the people you're passing to even like that archetype. You don't know what they first picked. Maybe they're going to play that. Maybe they're not. So I would just take the best card in the pack as usual most of the time and then see if that archetype is passed to me. And if it is, I would draft it. And if it's not, I would move on. Uh, there's no hard and fast rules for any of that, this. That's why draft is so amazing. That's why draft is the best. Uh, but in general, I don't worry much about what I'm passing. Uh, so, oh, sorry. And that question was from um, uh, Jordan. Uh, all right. Well, g just a couple more here. Uh, <laughs> Douglas asks, uh, hi guys, can we get a quick genius or grifter from Ben? Uh, I've got a, a couple examples here for you to weigh in on. Uh, one, Ian Duke in R&D buffed Navigator's Compass from gaining two life to gaining three life to make it more appealing to newer players. Uh, so, I mean, when you say genius or grifter, I know what those words mean, but like, are you asking me, did he succeed in tricking people into playing it? Or like, should he have been trying to trick people into playing it? Like, I'm not, I'm not well, really sure what I'm being good. asked exactly. Was this good? <laughs> uh, was this good or bad? Like, well, you, is this, oh yeah, that was a really smart move or like, oh, you well, shouldn't have done it. good done. because the card needed to be even a little better than it was. Dominaria is a slow format with lots of great stuff to splash. I feel like that was one of the only misses in a truly great limited format is that that card was just, just quite not good enough. Uh, if that card gained five life, then maybe it would have been a solid playable, but not too good. And then maybe the format would have been even more interesting. It, hard as that, hard as that is to believe since it really is an incredible format. So, I mean, I'm for the change from two to three. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll consider that a non-answer. Uh, what about <laughs> what about me picking up the token against Jeremy Dizani, uh in in game three of the? Well, Pro Tour? I don't think it was genius, and that I think that he was losing and not going to play around settle regardless of what you did that turn. 
Like if you had went to the bathroom and been and been like, just, you know, do everything up through attacks and then, you know, tell me and I'll come back for blocks or whatever, I think you would make the exact same play. That said, I have zero problem with it or whatever. Like it's fine. If you thought that was gonna go them into it or whatever, like cool, but <laughs> what if it was just to be a well, good Yeah, thing? I mean, that's usually your goal when you usually succeed. <laughs> right. Uh, all right. Well, well, one last uh, scenario here. What about, oh, actually, I guess this is two. Casting a spell into your opponent's Chalice of the Void. So they have Chalice on one. You play a one drop, hoping they won't notice. I mean, I think that's fine in a competitive setting. Uh, it's their trigger, so they have to do it. Uh, I think it would be wrong to try and, like, let's say, distract them or something. You know, like, I would never, like, cast my one drop and then ask my opponent, like, a question or something to get their mind off of their chalice. Like, I think stuff like that is angly and shady. But I think just playing the card itself... The word is grifter. Yeah, but in a, com- in a competitive <laughs> tournament... It's your, if it's your opponent's chalice, there's no ambiguity. They have to do it. You're doing absolutely nothing wrong if you just tap your one and put your one mana card in play. And then they say, you know, trigger my chalice and you put it in the yard immediately, of course, or they don't and they untap or whatever and then it stays in play. I mean, I don't know what's your opinion, but I don't think that's wrong. I think that's. No, I, I, I think that's fine. Uh, I, I agree with you on trying to distract your opponent while doing so is it does cross a line for me. What about uh, playing a spell into your own chalice and hoping your opponent doesn't know? Well, that's just cheating, right? I mean, like... That's not like an angle. That's just straight cheating, right? Like, it's your trigger. So if you know yeah. about it and then you hope your opponent doesn't notice, you should be banned for magic. That's just actual full-on cheating. <laughs> agreed, agreed. All right, Ben, is there anything else you want to bring up uh, before we close out the show here? Uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, (laughs) the things I would have said randomly, you've pretty much covered. Like, I'm really excited about Magic. I love Arena, and I love playing Magic online. I think everybody should check out Arena. I know a lot of times... Yeah, I know know a lot of times... (laughs) What? I didn't hear what you said, but... yeah, Look, it's, it's, it's I, I mean, you know that I love playing online so much that like in our testing houses and stuff, I'll sit on my laptop often and just play online rather than, yeah, rather oh, than totally. play in person. I started playing Magic Online right away, way back in the day. Uh, I, I like playing Magic on the internet. I like playing Magic on Magic Online. I just personally think Arena is just way better. Uh, just u- huge improvements. Like uh, the fact that it auto passes and auto taps and does all these things for you just better than Magic Online does makes the gameplay just way smoother and faster. And honestly, like I just, I love playing on it. I just play it all the time. And I know people are often scared of change and stuff like that, but I really think everybody should just embrace it and get on there and uh, see if they don't really enjoy it for what it is. Cool. Uh, thanks for hanging out with us, Ben. Uh, you can find Ben online at uh, is your Twitter is Ben S M T G uh, underscore M T G Ben S underscore M T G so at Ben S underscore M T G uh, makes appearances on channelfireball dot com as well just went up and yeah exactly uh, so Channel Fireball is a great place to find Ben Ben's content uh, and something I've somewhat volunteered you for is people tweeting draft picks at us uh, on Twitter I mean that's one of the things I think Twitter's oh I actually for. love that like when I wake up I check Twitter and I I always have a question or two that like makes me happy I, I seriously I love draft so much and just seeing other people drafting and talking about draft makes me really happy I've said this before but uh, constructed is okay like I love magic but for me it's basically okay and draft is amazing draft is why I play the game. So you can tweet draft questions at me anytime. Yeah, that's an awesome resource and uh, an unlimited one even. And I think it's actually really good to be able to take advantage of that. I think a lot of people 10 years ago wouldn't have had access to the, 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 the you know, the minds of the best players in the game. And Twitter really does give you that. They're, they're all just human beings. They check to run their phones all the time. And if you tweet at them, they'll see it. And a lot of the times, you know, you have people like Ben who are great about responding and, and saying like, yeah, I would pick this or I would do that. So I, I think it's actually a good strategic advice to, to utilize that. Definitely agreed. As for, as for myself, you can find me uh, at LSV uh, and, of course, ChannelFireball.com as well. Uh, thanks to our sponsor, well, Channel Fireball. We just talked about them. And then, of course, the Patreon. So make sure to check out the Limited Resources Patreon if you want to back the show. Uh, everything about the podcast can be found at LRCast.com. And, well, we'll see you back next week, or, or at least I will. So, Ben, uh, I, I do – so normally, you know, the sign-off is kind of my time to, to, to speak, but because, uh, you know, I, I, I kind of ran this episode and because you're here, I actually wanted to give you the floor with a question. Or I, pre- On a previous sign-off, I told the story of uh, 
you attempting to leave the Pro Tour to go play a Gen Con beta draft qualifiers. This was when the Pro Tour was in Minneapolis. The Gen Con beta draft qualifiers were Thursday before the Pro Tour, and you wanted to, to, to play in them. Tyler asked, Ben, can you give your side of the Gen Con beta draft qualifiers versus the Pro Tour story? Because something tells me it's been slightly modified when we've heard it previously. Though, honestly, Ben, would I ever put things that you do in a less than charitable light in order to make you look I'm more I'm really glad that now at the end of 2018, everybody's on to you. Everybody knows that your stories are just, <laughs> they're based in reality. You don't just make things up, but they're... <laughs> They're stretched to say the least, but <laughs> but I don't know what you said about it. But in this case, my side of the story is deck lists were due on Wednesday night. I personally am not worried about playing one more day of practice when I've already played weeks with my deck. I don't do the last minute switching thing like we talked about on this episode. I tend to test something. If it's doing okay, then I work on it a lot, learn it and play it. So Indy and Minneapolis are not that far apart. It's like an hour and a half flight or something. I thought it would be not a whole lot of trouble to go there, play them. Maybe I have to take a morning flight if I like win the last one at night or something. Most likely I just take like a Thursday night flight from 9 to 1030 from Indy to Minneapolis. And it's it's not really any trouble. I ended up not doing it because those flights didn't really exist. The latest flights out just weren't late enough. And for some reason, I mean, probably complicated Gen Con scheduling that had nothing to do with the Pro Tour, but the the beta qualifiers started pretty late. They, I was expecting when I heard about them for the first one to be at like 9 a.m. and the second one to be at like 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. and the third final one to be at like 6 p.m. And it was actually like 11, 3, and 7 or something like that. So I basically would have only been able to play like one and make a Thursday flight. And if I was even in like the second one, I'd probably have to take a, a Friday morning flight, which is something that I would consider a backup plan, but certainly not the primary plan. So I don't know what Luis said, but I mean, the story is true that I was definitely willing to be in Indy on Thursday, play them and then fly Thursday night uh, to the Pro Tour. Um I ended up not doing it because it wasn't going to be that smooth. I was almost, I was going to have to take a Friday flight virtually 100% of the time, and it just wasn't going to really work out because of the flights. But if there had been like a, a nice, you know, if they started a little earlier and there was just a nice 9 or 10 p.m. flight that would have gotten me into a mini that night, then I would have probably done it, to be honest. Two things to add to this. Uh, one, this was a team pro tour, so if Ben was late, Two of his teammates would have been very unhappy. Uh, the second is, Ben, you made the finals well, of this Pro Tour. <laughs> the second is not super relevant. I mean, obviously, if I knew I was going to make the finals of it, I wouldn't do it just because the beta draft and the uh, Pro Tour top four were on the same day. So I was going to have to skip the beta draft if I actually top four the Pro Tour. And I mean, let's be real. Pro Tours are all... Well, it depends. What, 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 t- what time does the beta draft start? <laughs> the pro Tours are amazing. I love them, and I don't top eight them that often. I've top eighted five, counting that, and I've played in like 50. So, I mean, it's I think it's totally reasonable to kind of plan for not top eighting and then just drop the other thing if you do top eight. The odds that I would have won a beta qualifier and made top four of the Pro Tour are pretty low. Um, as far as the uh, the first thing, though, the team thing, that was a factor that I ended up not doing it because my teammates were understandably not the most pleased that I was considering this. But but that said, <laughs> that's understandable. But that said, <laughs> like I don't sleep that well. That said, it, if the flights were different, yeah, I, like, still I don't <laughs> sleep that well before pro tours anyway. And in terms of real like value, not necessarily talking about totally understandable anxieties or things like that, but just in terms of actual like like tangible things, I'm not going to play meaningfully differently if I wake up in Indy on Thursday, play some beta qualifiers, and then fly to the Pro Tour from 9.30 to 11 or whatever, and then you know get to my room at midnight than I am if I'm in Minneapolis that Thursday, and then I go to my room and... I go to sleep whenever I fall asleep or whatever. So I don't think I was doing anything unreasonable by my teammates, but kind of at the same time, kind of what you were talking about with wearing the hats, I the different hats, I can kind of understand that that's something my teammates wouldn't necessarily appreciate or would be a little uncomfortable with. I kind of love this because your retelling of the story makes mine seem like yours was more ridiculous than mine. It was coming straight from the horse's mouth. So you actually told the story uh, fairly (laughs) accurately? 
I, I did, but I didn't get to the point where I was calling your teammates unreasonable for one, not wanting you to do I said, which, I, which I, you I got there. Wrong, I thought I just said it was totally understandable that they would be like. You said understandable, but that you're not actually. Yes, that I'm not so. actually going to play like differently in the pro tour based on whether I catch a you know hour and a half flight at night. Look, I'm just hoping the the stars align once again for another beta draft qualifier to be held before Team Pro Tour. But until then, uh, we're going to have to settle for Ben almost doing it, thwarted by flights. And, uh, and that was a good retelling of the story. So thanks again, Ben. And we will see everyone Thanks next for having time. me.